Good day, everyone, and welcome back to uh, today's Hidden Gem Share Cafe webinar. Thank you all for your time. Now, before we make a start, before we introduce the speakers, uh, we've got a new sponsor in Tiger Broking um, that I think you're going to hear a lot more about in the future. Now, Tiger is a NASDAQ listed uh, online broker. It's got 9 million uh, clients, and it's here to really take on the in online incumbents in the market. Uh, we've done our homework here. It's a fantastic app. It looks like Bloomberg. It's got live pricing and unlike any other online broker in the market, it's got a ton of content, takes Reuters feeds, et cetera. So we get our global insights. It's the first thing I look at it every morning. It's a great app and it enables us to kind of really look behind the numbers. So there's a special offer for Share Cafe audience, which includes 90 days of free brokerage and there's some free zip shares. All the details will be on our website next week. So download the Tiger Broking app have a look, use the Share Cafe password and uh, take a look. I reckon it's the best online trading platform I've seen in the market by a country mile. Okay, let's make a start. Don't forget to ask questions. First up, we have Holista Coltec, uh, which has a market cap of around 10 million. It's got an ASX code of HCT. Uh, One year return of minus 45%. We have with us Dr. Rajan Manika, who's the chairman and CEO. The company is dedicated to delivering first-class natural ingredients and wellness products and leads in research on herbs and food ingredients. Rajan, thank you for your time. You're coming to us from Malaysia. Over to you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good day to all of you. Um, yes, as Tim has said, you know, our focus is on natural health, natural ingredients. Uh, and if nothing, the last two years, we, we understand that even more now, you know, as COVID brought up, broke out. Uh, it was affecting those of us who were not well in some way or some form, and it was killing those of us who were even more unwell. So I think there's a new interest <clears throat> in health across the world. There's a new interest in healthy lifestyles across the world. I think we represent that opportunity uh, in a new way. Next. I mean, this is just standard disclaimers, which we have to do. So as we, we, we finished 2021 uh, well, we had good growth, good revenue. Uh, we take part in an industry that's growing uh, eight to nine percent, uh, which is uh, and has got a market where, uh, size of about four point four trillion dollars. Uh, we had strong rebound from two o two one, and we have good growth in two zero two, and our momentum continued into twenty twenty two, and we have multiple growth options across four divisions, um, and the uh, growth forecast interim at least till end of june is uh, we'll be growing about 26 percent uh into um, on, on the first half of the year next so we we went through a year of achievements uh, we've done we've got activity going on in china uh, as the whole world knows with china they've been a lockdown they're coming out of a lockdown right now and things are definitely moving faster there for our cosmetic collagen, which we got registered uh, with the Chinese authorities just before Chinese New Year. On the test kits, uh, you know, we had a surge, but you know, obviously there's been a slowdown in COVID worldwide. Uh, but I'm seeing now as we go into the uh, uh, second half of the year, there's a growth, uh, there's an increase, unfortunately, of COVID in nearly every of the 89 countries we're tracking right now. Um, we also showed that our sanitizer, Net Shield, uh, remains effective in the skin and heart surfaces of 12 hours, which means that you know if you use it, then you do, unlike alcohol where you've got to uh, you know, sanitize your hands every 20 or 30 minutes, here it'll last the entire year as long as you don't wash your hands. Um, and then we launched uh, late last year new products, sanitizing nasal balm and a water-soluble vitamin D. Um, for the low GI range, we've seen increase in orders uh, from Costanzos um, and in Malaysia from Rex Industries for the low uh, calorie sugar. Uh, we already had a first commercial order, more an R&D order from Country Farms and Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks Malaysia is uh, part of a listed company called Brajaya Foods. Uh, and Brajaya Foods tends to buy all products for their four franchises under, under them, uh, Starbucks. Kenny Rogers, 7-Eleven, uh, and another range of Mediterranean vegetarian food called Sala. 
So they buy it through country farms. We had the first order and um, now they are coming very close to a launch, a commercial launch in Malaysia for the low GI breads via Starbucks. Um, again, uh, we had early this year a positive uh, COVID test also for our all natural uh, nano silver disinfectant. And I think this is important because our nano silver is not made chemically, it's made biogenically, it's from biogenic sources, it's safe to drink, it's safe if applied on the skin, uh, it's safe if sprayed in the air and you inhaled it. Next. <clears throat> So these are the uh, uh, numbers for first half of second of this year, first half, right? So we we had uh, we broke record highs in in terms of receipts, two point eight million. Um, our operational cash flow has improved significantly, uh, and that's despite the fact we made some inventory um, investments uh, with a declining uh, ringgit in Malaysia or a declining Australian dollar versus the US dollar. Uh, we thought it was made sense to bulk up a bit on our inventory uh, with increased logistic costs. It also made, made more sense for us to uh, build up inventory. So despite that, we've seen our cash flows improve. Um, forecast for the first half is a growth of about 26% to about 4.5 million. Uh, this is due to the multiple growth drivers. Um, and we see this now uh, post, uh, going positively for the second half of the year. Um, as I said earlier, we've invent, we have invested heavily in, in um, building inventory to manage both uh, inflation as well as supply risk to meet customer demand. Uh, what we see will be a stronger growth in the second half of the year. Next. So we saw a V-shaped recovery like everybody else. We through suffered through COVID, uh, but uh, in terms of sales and growth, we've seen a recovery and we expect this to continue uh, into 2022. Uh, revenues were up 13%, up to 8 million for financial year 21. Um, and our financial year ends December 31st. Uh, net losses have improved. And this year, it we, will, we will improve this position further. Um, three out of the four divisions uh, posted double digit growth. Uh, gross margins uh, have expanded from cost control and a change in our product mix. Next. Uh, the bulk of the business is still in Malaysia uh, with our supplements, dietary supplements, uh, where we are market leader by Nielsen standing uh, with fish oil with a brand called Pristine and with Lacto5, with a with probiotic with a brand called Lacto5. I mean, we beat all other brands in these two categories uh, and we, we are continuing to push harder into the market with this and we will expect two launches um, before end of the year. We are growing faster than market, obviously. Uh, in fact, we have more than 38% uh, growth over the previous corresponding period um, of that alone to 1.5 million. Um, the new products, uh, vitamin D, interblock, et cetera, will assist the growth as we go into the second part of this year. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, COVID has kind of brought a new realization. The same guys who never go to the gym, who smoke, who drink, who who, who, who are diabetic, who, who never once in their life walk into the pharmacy looking for supplement, are now, according to my friends, uh, looking for vitamin C and vitamin D and um, tiger milk mushroom, which is very popular in the Chinese, uh, as a way to protect themselves from this ongoing um, issues of infections. And overnight, the US has now declared monkeypox as, an, as a health emergency. So that is again going to spike the need for people to supplement with dietary supplements. You know, we've seen many studies in the course of this last two years. Uh, one in particular shows that, you know, if your vitamin D is high enough, you will never enter an I ICU. It's a study in New York. If your vitamin C is low, low enough, then you'll, you'll probably not survive the ICU. So there's a new interest in vitamins, C and D particularly, but also many of these uh, mushrooms and herbs uh, that people have record that improve their sense of immunity and well-being. Next. Um, you know, the, the pandemic before the pandemic and the pandemic after this pandemic will be 
obesity and diabetes. And that is being coined in the term called diabetes. Um, and and the, for that one, unfortunately, there's no vaccine, right? So we've had a breakthrough uh, as the world's first low GI white bread. We had a score of 46, <clears throat> which is the lowest that's recorded anywhere in the world. Uh, we've tied up with Costanzos. Now we're tying up with Starbucks in Malaysia. Um, and Starbucks in Malaysia uh, has a very strong slant towards vegan. So they've asked us to come up <clears throat> with menu, not only breads, but also a vegan range. Uh, and we work with a team. As I mentioned earlier, uh, they have uh, four other franchises, which we want to engage with as well. But I think this is an area where with diabetes, with obesity, you know, Australia is the global leader with the University of Sydney, uh, specifically on glycemic index, low GI. Uh, Professor Jenny Brand Miller and her team at Sydney, we work very closely with them. We do all the testing uh, with them in Sydney before we launch. Um, and uh, they've been a great partner to work with, but they have made Australia a, a, a world player in low glycemic index. In fact, Australia has the highest density of low glycemic index products. Um, so we think that this is a range that, you know, as, as time goes on, again, linked to COVID, because we know those who died of COVID died of diabetes, the obese were more likely to die of, di of COVID. So again, a movement, um, towards healthier eating, where most people do not want to make a sacrifice. They still want their bread. Uh, they still want their, their noodles and pastas. And so we can offer them options where we add these ingredients, which are patented, which are all natural. And uh, if they consume this, then their blood sugar uh, is not going to spike as it normally would. Um, and we do it without the need for any change in taste or color or, or smell. Uh, and the, our partners who are manufacturing do not need to make any tweak in their production lines. So we think there's an, off, uh, an opportunity uh, for people to move to a healthy lifestyle, for the industry to, 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 to align with that. And I think the other bigger point is it's extremely affordable. Uh, <clears throat> it will add maybe 10% to the final product cost not more than that. Next. Infection control, we, we had this division uh, starting off uh, in the course of um, uh, uh, 2020, right? And um, we had a few products we were looking at in terms of um, in this space, uh, and we have quite a bit of activity there. Uh, we, you know, although there was a very poor quarter, uh, this year, uh, we expect more activity given the fact that COVID is coming back uh, somewhat with vengeance in many countries. Next. Um, you know, if we talk about hidden gems, then this is it. Um, Australia is the only country in the world with disease-free sheep. That's very unique. The government has invested very heavily uh, for uh, biocontrol of all the borders. And um, the other thing is, you know, sheep is the only uh, mammal that we grow in large quantities that is both uh, without cultural uh, difficulties and is extremely friendly um, to people. So, you know, we think that this is an amazing product that we want to develop further. We now have a cosmetic, but we're moving into um, uh, food grade and trying to partner up to do the medical grade collagen. Next. So we, we finished this year with a very positive outlook uh, and we think that this will build uh, into, uh, we finished last year and we, we think this will build into 2022 and 2023 and beyond. Next. So these are our, our members of board and directors um, and uh, I won't go through in individually, but Roscoe Moore, uh, who is our chief scientific advisor, is the former U.S. Deputy Surgeon General, serving both President Bush and Clinton. Uh, he's also part of the Global Viral Network, top 40 scientists who, who um, advise the world on pandemics, which includes COVID as well as now uh, monkeypox. Next. With that, I say thank you and would like to sign off. Thanks, Rajan. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here, if you don't mind, before you go. 
Sure. Um, now, what, what we're seeing in the US, you've seen a, a, a build up of in, inventories. And you, you spoke about uh, your inventory levels. Yeah. Um, and, and you've seen some kind of forced discounting because obviously the supply chain during COVID has been really messy. So yes. I can understand why you've, you've built up on your inventories, but is that a, a risk, a potential risk also moving forward? Uh, well, we're not building up inventory, you know, for more than a, not even more than six months, number one. We're building that inventory up on the basis of projections given by our partners. We also, uh, the products that we're sending, they are the raw materials that go into the into the bread that and the pastas we're making there, and these have a shelf life of five years. So if we don't see a risk of, you know, massive write-offs because they, they are long expiry products. Uh, understood. Um, now, and, and how do you build a strong brand in, in what is kind of a really competitive industry? Um, I think you know from <clears throat> from a branding point of view, you know, we if you don't have a very uh, a very clearly differentiated product, it becomes very difficult. So we had we thought then, and we obviously proven right. We thought we had very differentiating benefits and features, um, and uh, both our fish oil and our probiotics, and we had the sufficient third party credibility, um, and obviously then we went ahead and executed that. Uh, in the case of fish oil, for example, uh, we are pure to parts per sub-trillion. And in Malaysia, we give out uh, a reward of roughly 350000 Australian dollars for any Malaysian who can prove at any one time there was any amount of toxin in any form in our product. And I'm pleased to say for the last three years, nobody's picked us up on that offer, including all our competitors. Uh, for Lacto5, we had their localized probiotics. There is clinical evidence that if your gut bacteria are from local sources, they survive longer and they perform better. And typically people, in, at least in Malaysia, we tend to look out to imported products, whether Australia, Japan, Korea, uh, US, right? But we on the shelf have beaten every imported probiotics because local, when it comes to your gut, is always better. Understood. And, and just quickly on that ovine uh, collagen, product can you just give us a little bit more color on that we didn't have much time i'm sorry okay yes i'm sorry too i i would have wanted to talk more um first of all is as far as being a cosmetic ingredient you know uh, collagen is probably the best in terms of skin moisturizing uh with the chinese now we're developing four products and they're quite excited so it's moving along faster post covid uh but you know we also been working on nano collagen which means it will cross the skin not just stay on the skin um we're making good progress there too um, and then we think that, you know, we've, we've already developed food grade ingredients, a food grade collagen, but we need a strong partner who can provide us skins. And we're talking to at least two uh, players right now, one in New Zealand, one in Australia as a joint venture partner. But ultimately, you know, if you want to look at collagen, then medical grade collagen is where, you know, the future is. Um, uh, the last time uh, we, and we've announced this already, uh, one kilogram of medical grade collagen is 540,000 Australian dollars. It's worth more than gold. So we've got really a mine in Kali where we do the collagen that has got no life on it. It'll go on forever. And, um, uh, and you know, if you think of collagen, it's the most common protein in the human body. It's what we will lose as we age. It's what we'll lose when we are injured or we get burns. It's very big in, in the burns business. But the future is going to be organ printing. And a top Israeli doctor has already said in the next 10 years, uh, any hospital that does not have an organ printing unit attached to it will not be taken seriously, right? So you're going to have a, a day when you go to a doctor and doctor's going to say, look, I have really bad news. Your kidney, your left kidney has got cancer. But guess what? We're going to call you back in three weeks. We're going to print it for you. And in those scenarios, our collagen is 70% of the ink that they use to print. So we think that there's a very big future there. And we are working right now with a company in the US on this. Right, Dr. Rajan um, Manika, thank you for your time. Um, we'll get you back on another time. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Tali, market cap of around $7.5 million. We have with us Mary Beth Brenson, who is the CEO. The company is a pioneering digital therapeutic company developing solutions to assess monitor and enhance cognitive function and treat cognitive impairment. Mary Beth, thank you for your time. Over to you. Thank you, Tim. Um, 
I'm very happy to be here this afternoon to talk about uh, quite a passion of mine, which is um, supporting diagnostics and assessment in children um, with uh, neurological uh, neurodiverse um, diagnoses. Next slide, please. So Tally is um, storming new fronts on in two areas. One is um, working as a medical device um, and delivering a therapeutic digitally. So if we talk about the medical device part first, um, work at the level of um, the brain for children, frankly, and we're looking and depending on the neuroplasticity in children to um, provide early intervention in areas right now where there's not uh, intervention available early, particularly if you look at things like ADHD, where frequently the behavior is seen but the um, ability to intervene is not um, prescribed until later. So the average age of intervention for ADHD is seven um, and usually comes after quite a bit of uh, stress, family stress, school stress. Um, and so for understanding that for developmental issues, you're always, always, always going to get a better outcome if you start thinking about how you intervene earlier. So the medical device part of TALI works very much um, on an early intervention model that trains attention through gamification. The other part that's quite innovative and has been supported um, and pushed along, frankly, by COVID is the digital delivery. So for people working in medical devices or medicine, medicine is difficult to change and that's okay because uh, the reason for that is it takes a long time to build a core of evidence. And as a practitioner, you tend to stay with what you know. And so delivering care in a different way, um, people are gonna wanna see that it works. And um, prior to COVID, uh, there wasn't a huge take up of digital therapeutics, things that could be done outside of the office, but we're seeing a great deal of interest now in uptake. Um, for children, this becomes critical because if you think about children that have um, long-term disorders, chronic disorders, things that are not like a broken leg that you know has medical implications, but that ends at some point. Chronic disorders um, are things that have to be managed over the lifetime of the person. And the um, constant medicalization and interruption for the family through taking time off work or um, and certainly taking the child out of school um, is, is not highly desirable. And so the ability now for medical professionals to prescribe a, a therapy and monitor its use, but it's being used in the home is very important. An overlay to that too is working with children is that frequently when the children show up in your office, their behavior is different than what the parent describes. Um, it's better or worse sometimes, um, either way, but you know, you, they come in and, and the mom is saying, hey, he's never like this at home, you know, or you're not gonna see what I see. So being able to assess children and deliver therapeutics at home and record um, the outcome that a therapist then can look at and access through a portal to see how things are going actually becomes an invaluable piece of a diagnostic puzzle that is quite missing right now in, in how we deal with children. Uh, a few years ago, these types of medical devices, digital therapeutics became regulated globally. So in Europe, um, in the United States and in Australia, they're classified as medical devices. Um, and that provide that provides surety to the professional and to the family, but also gives um, uh, the need to present evidence, to have an evidence base for what you do. Um, the other thing that you're seeing now is because of all of these factors, the, the need to intervene earlier, the understanding of neuro, better understanding of neuroplasticity and digital delivery, you're starting to see an uptick in um, companies that are IPOing like the Achille company that we've got listed on the bottom of the slide there that will IPO um, soon at a high valuation in the United States. Um, Achille is also a strategic partner um, and will be how Tally goes to market in the United States as well. Next slide, please. So people say, ah, in attention, why is that important? Why is it? Why do you start with attention? Why not start with a diagnosis? Um, interestingly enough, attention is frequently the first symptom 
for a myriad of issues that you see in children. So you can have inattention in children that is quite typical and just a late development, but you also see attention as a core um, issue in things like ADHD, um, autism, anxiety disorders, other mental health disorders. So it's an early um, behavior that can be seen. And so it also uh, lends itself to understanding um, if you can work at the level of inattention, can you improve the upstream behavior um, impacts? So there have been quite a bit of work looking at inattention, and these are just some facts and figures so that you can see that um, it is one of the mo more highly re uh, reported issues that parents and teachers see. Um, of the just my child's not paying attention, a significant portion of those go on to receive a diagnosis of some sort, like anxiety or autism or ADHD. Um, and that's really where Tally shines. Um, as a medical device, there is the ability to work prior to a diagnosis if, if that is required. So you don't have to have a diagnosis to be able to access the tool and improve your attention. Um, it helps drive down that age of um, age of diagnosis, age of impact, because you don't have to wait to see the cluster of symptoms that are um, required to receive a diagnosis as listed in the DSM. You can start working early um, and it will take some of the burden off some of the healthcare systems, particularly in Australia now, developmental pediatricians and developmental psychologists um, the wait for a diagnosis for those professionals can be up to two years, which in an early intervention model um, is, is really, really tragic. Um, when you see a problem, the idea that you have to wait six months or a year or two years to actually receive a diagnosis in order to start therapy. Next slide, please. So this is just some facts and figures on the scale. The um, focus on the last few years of really trying to understand autism and ADHD and anxiety in children really comes from looking at what is the impact over the lifetime of people that have these diagnoses and understanding you know, if there can be better therapeutics um, and better support, can you reduce the overall burden, not just to the individual, but to society as a whole and to the economic, society, um, economic system as a whole? So next slide, please. So I wanted to break it down for just Australia um, because I think we get lost in the United States sometimes. So the market in the United States is obviously huge, but it's quite significant in Australia. And being an Australian company, we're really looking to make a difference here in Australia. Um, and, and while we are doing the go-to-market required activities in the United States, which is running studies um, for the FDA approval, we're also um, doing similar things in Australia to be able to help the kids here. So the market in Australia is significant um, and is um, probably not reported on in the same way that it is in the US. Next slide, please. So what I know about medicine is that you know that things will change when you start getting um, economic cost. So these are just two studies, one from the United States and one from um, that was done in Australia, looking at the cost of not doing anything or the cost of the current um, therapeutic and treatment pathway now. So um, these were both done looking at ADHD, which is a um, neurodiverse diagnosis. Um, and the cost is quite high to the burden to social and economic cost is quite high. I think there's been quite a bit of press lately about the untreated or undertreated adult and the high, um, the high reported um, mental illnesses and things that come from really struggling with these kind of uh, developmental disorders for your whole life. And what, and what that does. And again, it pushes this early intervention model that um, you know it's not as visible as some other disabilities, but if it's not um, addressed, it, it causes a lot of issues that have to be dealt with later. I think, in, interestingly enough, for things like ADHD, um, when I say this, people are a bit shocked. There's actually no treatment for ADHD. There is um, there are things that you do for the end symptoms. So you have behavior modification um, where you see um, an OT or a psychologist to help you modify the behaviors that are causing you problems. 
Um, and then if if nothing else, there's pharmacological treatment for the end behaviors. But again, at, when you're when you come off the drugs or when the drug wears off, you're back to where you started. And in this early intervention model, what we're looking at is we're really working at the level of the brain early on to see if we cannot um, modify those behaviors before you see them so that we can improve the signal so that the behaviors are not as strong or as not you know, not as um, driving undesirable behaviors and outcomes. Um, next slide, please. And so what we have is a gamified solution. Anything you do with young children, therapy is provided through play therapy and games. Um, you know, now all children born are digitally native. They all play games. And so these games are uh, clinically proven through randomized control trials to demonstrate that you can improve attention, which again is a core um, core cognitive ability that you'd be looking to improve in this. And so we have a, an assessment tool called Detect and a training tool called Train that um, the child plays at home with the parents um, and then the um, professional monitors through a portal that they have back at the office. Next slide, please. Okay. Any questions? We've got some questions. Thanks, Mary Beth. Now, you're a, a new CEO appointed recently. What, what attracted you to Tali? Um, I have been interested. So I my background is uh, uh, a clinical um, professional, and then I moved into research and academia. And then I moved to a medical device company for 16 years with the same interest, same area of interest, always chronic health care not just for children, but particularly in children because of the outcomes it drives later in their life. Um, the digital therapeutic, I think is, is, and I do hate the word game changing, but it is such an alternative to a model that is so heavy for the family right now. Um, so Tally attracted me because there's not a lot available for children um, that have neurodiversity um, diagnosis. And the help that is available is through the traditional medical model, which is take off work, take child out of school and go. So I've had a great interest in um, the digital therapeutics since they've come about. And um, I thought this was a great opportunity. And, and what's, what's the business model behind the product? So it's three professionals. So again, when you've got these, uh, when you've got children, a lot of children also have other conditions as well. Um, you don't want to uh, disintermediate the medical professional. So the medical model is working with the OT and the psychologist initially um, and their prescription of these tools. Australia doesn't require prescription, but we'd still call it a prescription because you have a medical professional that is judging that this is suitable for that particular child. In the United States, it is a prescription model, like you would get a script for um, you know, a, pharm a pharmaceutical. But it is through that we work through the medical professionals um, and then they prescribe this to be used at home. And so when, when you push this into the US, it, it requires FDA approval? Um, yes, it requires TGA approval here in Australia as well. And uh, CE marking in Europe. And, and just quickly, we've got to finish up. What, what's the kind of uh, the milestones looking ahead? Um, looking ahead will be um, the, uh, met the model, the business model here in the United States, um, delivering on that. Um, and we'll be ramping up that over the next few months. Uh, new product delivery as well. Um, and then in the United States, we'll be um, knocking off the clinical trials that we need to do. Um, and right now we're in the pilot stage um, and we'll be delivering a pivotal trial Do that. And then we will um, exercise the agreement we have with Achille and sit in their dis distribution model in the United States. Mary Beth, nice to meet you. Thanks for your time. Um, we'll follow the story with interest. Have a nice weekend. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, next up we have Cosmos Exploration, ASX code C1X, market cap around $6 million, doesn't have a one-year return, recently spun out of RareX. We have with us Jeremy Robinson, who's the non-executive director. The company engages in the acquisition, exploration, and development of mineral resource projects in Australia. Jeremy, thanks for your time. Over to you. Yes, thanks, Tim, uh, and thanks to Share Cafe for hosting us in the Cosmos Exploration. Uh, as Tim mentioned, this is a company that was spun out of uh, RareX uh, late last year and has been very active uh, with a systematic approach to uh, exploration at our flagship project at Borrow East, uh, targeting uh, higher grade nickel copper PGE uh, discoveries in that region. 
Uh, next slide, please. And again. Yeah, so look, our, our main undertaking is the Biro East project. It's uh, located in Western Australia. It's uh, basically, this is ground that Rarex picked up prior to the, uh, the Julemar discovery, which has made uh, shareholders of Chalice Mining uh, lots of money. Uh, we picked it up, well, Rarex picked it up initially looking for rare earths, but as we looked at it harder, we became, became more and more evident that it's a nickel copper PGE massive sulphide play. Um, and look, we've been actively exploring it for the last, you know, almost 12 months now, and we're at the, at the pointy part of uh, preparing to drill now, which is really exciting for us. Uh, within the company, uh, we also have the um, Orange East project located uh, near the very large Cadia mine in New South Wales, so elephant country once again. And once we've um, finished with um, uh, Biro this year, we will turn our attention to the Orange East project as well. So. Two very uh, high potential projects within the company. We actively look at other projects, but we haven't found anything yet that uh, beats what we're currently trying to do with both Biro East and Orange East. Uh, next slide, please. So here we are located on a map. Um, as I mentioned, Biro East in Western Australia, we're um, on the um, Western nice terrain, we call that there. Uh, we've been systematically exploring and we've just announced this morning our, our very exciting uh, late to mid-time bedrock conductors. We've had 31 uh, conductors identified. We've got uh, about seven priority one targets. Uh, we're out there ground shooting them at the, at the moment and we look to be drilling in uh, October this year. As I mentioned, Orange East project there, uh, probably the nearest project to that that you may be aware of is the McPhillamy's project. Uh, that's now owned by Regis Resources. That's a multi-million ounce gold deposit and we're directly along strike from that. Next slide. So capital structure, still a very tight capital structure and that's a result of us listing only last uh, December. Uh, cash 3.3, so well funded to achieve our goals this year and into early next year. Uh, extremely tight register, only 500 uh, shareholders. Uh, you, so any any shareholder, any um, drill drill bit success will be quickly rewarded with share price appreciation, and we look forward to doing that uh, in the coming months. Board of management. Uh, I'm the executive chairman. Um, my main role is uh, with Rarex Limited, but also spend a lot of time with Cosmos as well. Well supported with our exploration manager, Christian Hendrickson, uh, comes from Encounter and uh, Extrata before that, is a very well credentialed um, uh, geologist and has done an amazing job over the last uh, six to nine months in pushing this project forward to the point where we've got some really exciting drill targets. Uh, just recently, Matthew Friedman has joined us. He's an executive director of Dynamic Holdings Group, uh, so a a drill and blast specialist and also uh, very handy for um, getting access to drill rigs in this market. Uh, James Bain also sits on our board as our um, director and company secretary. Uh, you can see on this map on the right why we're attracted to this area. Uh, it's an area that has been uh, under underdone in the last 20 years. Obviously got a lot more attention since the very large Julemar discovery. So it's what we term the uh, the Western Nice terrain. It uh, you know it comes up from the southwest of Western Australia all the way into the Murchison. It's basically hugging the uh, western side of the Yilgarn Craton and uh, is a, a very interesting part of the world to go exploring these days uh, with the new knowledge we have about the formation of these uh, nickel copper PGE deposits. Next slide, please. So Borough East, here we are zooming in a bit more. Uh, these are the uh, the tenements that are in the company. Basically, we're focusing on the middle part of the of the package there. Uh, there's a very large intrusion called the Milli Milli intrusion, which has long been known about that sits just to the uh, to the west of our tenure. You could even say part of it extends into our tenure. But this is a very large intrusion. Um, uh, uh, major players have looked at it in the past. It has analogies to the Mount Keith uh, deposit. But what we're looking for is uh, massive sulphide bodies hanging off the, off the side of this intrusion, and we're getting uh, great success in um, identifying these targets at the moment. So what we've done in the last uh, six to 12 months is a very extensive uh, multi-element uh, soil survey. This is to help us identify uh, any geochemical anomalies that sit within our package. Ground gravity, we've done 662 stations uh, with our ground program, uh, ground gravity program there. And that's to help us identify the, the denser rocks, the mafic rocks, which will be the source of our nickel copper PGE sulfide deposits. Airborne magnetic and radiometric survey, we've done that. 
and also recently just announced this morning uh, the results of our recently completed um, VTEM survey. So VTEM survey, that's an airborne electromagnetic uh, system, electromagnetic system, and that is there to pick up any uh, potential, any conductive uh, ore bodies in the bedrock. Uh, these can either be uh, sulfides, massive sulfides, shales, but uh, we're hoping these are nickel sulfide deposits. And uh, next slide, please. So this is the data. This is zooming into it a bit closer. This is um, uh, our this is the, the the middle tenure we have uh, within our package. You can see we've de we've defined about uh, thirty one mid to late time conductors. The mid to late time conductors are interpreted to be bedrock, so you're not talking about surface effects. We're talking about uh, as I mentioned, you know, either conductive shales or massive sulfides. We're hopeful they're massive sulfides, and once again, we're hopeful, they're, hopeful they contain uh, abundant nickel copper as well. So we've identified that we've got 31 there. We've got, um, you know, probably seven to eight high priority targets, which we in areas which we will look. Uh, the blue bottle, glass wing, dotty back, they all look compelling to us, um, and we will get out there uh, and and ground through them in the coming days, and hopefully drilling them in into October. Next slide, please. So just zooming in on one of these uh, targets itself, this is the one that uh, really excites us and our, uh, our geophysical consultants as resource potentials. This is a coincident uh, soil anomaly, it's coincident gravity anomaly, it's coincident regional magnetic anomaly, and lo and behold, it has uh, two EM conductors of significant uh, length and size hanging off the side. I mean, this could be a slide that, uh, you know, uh, overlays a overlays a deposit pre-discovery. You wouldn't be surprised if uh, this one turns into something for us. Obviously, the truth will be in the drill bit, but that's where we will go to next. So we're very excited by this target. We've got you know half a dozen other targets that look just as compelling as this, but this is the one we're going to we've uh, talked about in our present in our release today, and we will talk and we will probably be the first one we drill with our our drill program in October. Next slide. So that was our our, um, our Borough East project. We also have our Orange East projects, as I mentioned at the start, these are located in New South Wales. Uh, these this is a very good package of uh, ground here. We're also looking to acquire further ground in the area. Uh, this will be a project that we will uh, move on to after we've been drilling our um, Borough East project. Hopefully we get held up at Borough East drilling out of discovery, but if that doesn't um, come to pass, we will move on to Orange East project. So what are we looking at for here? Uh, primarily McPhillamy's style gold deposits. This is a 2.3 million ounce deposit, uh, I think found by Newmont originally and passed on to Regis and is just in the process of becoming a mine at the moment. So this is an area that's uh, been underdone. Uh, we're negotiating our way through access agreements at the moment. So once we've got that, we'll be on the ground, um, hopefully drill testing some of these targets, following up on work that was done by previous operators um, Probably we'll probably be out there around Christmas into January, February next year. Next slide. Look, this is it in a more of a regional context as well. Uh, just to point out some of the other major discoveries in the area. Uh, obviously, North Park's major copper gold producer, Acadia. Uh, I think is now Australia's second or first largest gold producer at the very low cash costs. Uh, the recent exciting discovery by Bodo. Uh, by Alcane up at Boda, a very large copper gold porphyry system as well. And also within the belt, you have some uh, rather interesting VMS uh, projects as well, like Lewis Ponds. So multiple styles of targets from uh, gold to copper gold porphyries to more um, base metal rich VMS targets. So a very exciting area for us to go exploring. Next slide. So the work that's previously been done here, uh, our, uh, the previous operators from which we got this company and was the last thrust of work in 2009 to 2010, did some uh, soil sampling, uh, did some IP work uh, and did some um, modelling of that IP and a couple of drill holes as well. So you can see there's extensive uh, soil anomalies there, uh, extensive rock chip, um, outcropping, copper, gold mineralisation. The, the previous operators put a couple of drill holes into some IP shells, which we now interpret weren't uh, optimal drill holes on the reprocessing of the data. So we are uh, reprocessing all that um, geophysical in, you know, and marrying that into our uh, 
into the geochemistry as well. And that's leading us towards some uh, more compelling drill targets. So we'll, as I said, we'll look to get out there this summer. Next slide. So look, that's uh, Rare Ec, and that's uh, Cosmos, I should say very quickly. Um, what we've got is a very couple of really exciting projects uh, in the nickel, copper, gold space. Burrow East is the one you need to focus on in the short term, Orange East in the, in the mid term, but Burrow is some really compelling uh, EM uh, coincident with our geochemistry uh, targets. And we look forward to uh, drilling those projects uh, in October. So that, that time is coming around quickly. And we all know what can happen when you uh, snag a, a nickel copper uh, discovery. Um, share prices can appreciate uh, vastly and very quickly. So thanks for listening. We're very leveraged to exploration and we think we've got a good team on board to deliver on our exploration potential. So thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, of course, you're also uh, CEO of um, Rare X. How do you manage both roles? Is the plan to bring new management into um, Cosmos? Uh, look, yes, I am the managing director of Rare X, and I look. Most of the work here is done by uh, Christian Hendrickson. I can't take any of the, the glory in what's been going on, but uh, uh, long term, yes, this uh, company will have its own um, managing director. And uh, but at the moment, we've uh, managed to to work through it quite well. Uh, as I say, Christian is the one leading the charge here and I'm here to just to give the presentations and explain to the market what, what he's been doing. Um, but yeah, no, we manage it quite quite well at this point in time. Understood. And there's actually a question here, good question. Does Rare X uh, have any potential to, to mine the, 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 the biro land for you know, Rare Earths if there's potential there? Uh, look, Rarex has a shareholding in Cosmos of about 30%. We have, uh, Rarex has no uh, formal buyback rights in or act, um, mining rights to Rare Earth there. We just have our exposure through the through the shareholding. There is Rare Earth potential on that ground still, although we very much see it as a nickel copper play at this point in time. Sure. And, and you mentioned today's announcement. Can you give us a bit more colour for those that missed it? Yeah, today's announcement was just around the uh, the processing of the VTEM, the airborne, airborne electromagnetic survey we've can, we've done. Uh, that was basically outlined in a, a few of the slides in the presentation there. But we've got some really compelling um, EM targets, some up to sixteen hundred metres long. Uh, they basically bullseye uh, EM uh, magnetic targets and, and need to be drilled now. So we're really excited with that. With that results, uh, even the geophysicists are really excited as well, which is always a good thing. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's what it's about. It's about uh, defining targets and going out, going out to drill them now. And and is it competitive out there for resources? You know, you spoke about someone, uh, they're securing drill rigs. rigs. How, how's it look out there? Yeah, look, it is competitive. It's competitive for drill rigs. It's competitive for people. Uh, look, it's even... It's hard getting flights in Western Australia at the moment, mm. but look, the whole the whole landscape is competitive. Um, but look, we've got the people we need within um, Cosmos, and we've, especially with someone like Matt Friedman on our board, we will get access to drill rigs as and when we need them. So we're in a pretty good position in that regard. And, and while it's early days for Cosmos, you you have got some big uh, big time neighbours. Do you, do you anticipate any kind of M and A out there uh, looking forward? Oh, look, I think we'll, we'll try and make a discovery first before we go uh, start thinking about M&A. But um, look, uh, yep, I guess that is always the one of the one of the end games for an exploration resource company is to get involved in M&A. But at this point, we're just focused on the on exploration and, and, and finding something for which someone wants to take us over for. <laughs> and, and Jeremy, just just uh, finally, what are some of the kind of key milestones looking forward in terms of you know drilling result timeline? Look, the key milestones from here, uh, ultimately drilling in October, but to uh, just to finalise on processing of our airborne EM targets, which we'll do in the next three to four uh, weeks, uh, ground truthing some of our targets, um, just going through the heritage process at the moment, which will be fine. But yeah, the main short term target is getting that drill rig out there in October and getting results back from that drill program prior to Christmas. And hopefully we can, we can have a good Christmas on some encouraging results. Good luck out there, Jeremy. Um, we'll speak to you soon. Have a nice weekend. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Okay, next up we have Mallee Resources, ASX code MYL. 
We have with us John Lamb, who's the Managing Director. Mally's vision is to build a high value business by sustainably supplying critical minerals for an electric future. Uh, John, thanks for your time, over to you. Well, thanks, Tim, uh, and hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be speaking to you today. Um, as you can see by my attire, I'm actually sitting on site at Avery Nickel Mine right now. And in fact, if you look at the picture on your screen there, I'm at the very far right hand end of the in the building at the front there. So that's uh, precisely where I'm sitting. And so allow me to introduce you to Avery. What you see on the screen is a picture of what I think a modern critical minerals mine in Tasmania should look like. Uh, Avery is located about three kilometres inland from the west coast of Tasmania near Trial Harbour. And if you look at the top left of the image, um, you can actually see the sea. So you can see how close we are. And besides the portal and a couple of vent fans, what you see on the photograph there is pretty much the entire site complex. Um, so that's Avery in a single frame. It's small, it's clean, it's complete and it's productive. It produces battery grade nickel sulphide and it's powered by hydroelectricity. So Avery makes Mali Australia's next nickel sulphide producer with the opportunity to make our nickel as green as we want to. Uh, next slide, please. Hand over one more. So Avery is a rarity and because of Avery, Mali is the world's only pure play nickel sulphide company with its production from a tier one jurisdiction powered by predominantly green power. So that's as we understand it, we know of no others. And the case for Avery is utterly compelling. 29.3 million tonnes of Jork 2012 resource with over a quarter of a million tonnes of nickel in the ground, one of the largest nickel sulphide deposits in Australia at this point in time. And of course, it's not just any nickel, it is nickel sulphide, pentlandite. They call it class one nickel, and it's the nickel that is used to make battery products. And Tasmania, of course, is one of the most stable, well-regulated and well-serviced mining jurisdictions in the world. And our location on the West Coast offers accommodation, services, clean grid power, good transport links, a supportive community in which to live and operate our business. We have hydropower to the mine gate and a sealed road to the door and a town nearby to accommodate our workforce. Um, so it's a pretty special location. Thank you. The corporate picture is pretty simple for us at this point in time. We have 300 million shares on issue. We're raising capital right now. We're out live in the market with a prospectus. We're raising at 70 cents and we aim to raise perhaps as much as $70 million to get the mine moving, buy the fleet, expand the mine and explore for more apiaries. Hartree Metals, as you can see on the donut there, is our largest shareholder. They're a metals trader. They're backed by Hartree Partners in the US and then in turn above them by Oak Tree Capital, one of the largest US private equity funds. Uh, so we've got a pretty good pedigree going back up the tree. Uh, looking to the right hand side of the slide, the directors are well experienced. Um, we've been together for quite some time now. Jeff's a geologist. Rowan is an accountant. Paul's a metallurgist and Steve is a trader and financier. Uh, but to introduce myself, uh, my background's in mine technical services, but I guess I'd describe myself as a specialist in mine management. And I can tell you that on New Year's Day next year, it's going to be 35 years since I first started work in the industry. So I've led numerous mines, including this one, once upon a time in the past, and I've decided to pull the boots back on to make sure that the restart goes well. So I'm a little different to most MDs that you might meet. I'm very hands-on. I'm fully committed to personally leading the restart of this mine. I've got great knowledge of the asset. And if I'm honest, a little bit of a following in Tasmania. Uh, and that's why we're able to recruit great people and make such a quick start, uh, which has been to our advantage. Thank you. So the case for nickel is very clear. As well as its traditional uses in various alloys and, and most notably stainless steel, nickel is used these days in batteries because it increases the energy density. So put simply, the battery lasts longer and so your electric vehicle has greater range. And of course, the world has made its decision and there is no stepping back from it. Globally, we are decarbonising. We need battery grade nickel to do that and there isn't enough. It's as simple as that. Manufacturers are scrambling to lock in supplies of high ESG low carbon, conflict free, and I guess you could perhaps read Russian free there, nickel sulphide. In other words, the nickel sulphide that we make at Avery. It's estimated that we are 60 mines short 
of being able to make enough nickel by the end of this decade. Now, that's according to the IEA, uh, the International Energy Association. And of course, the Samsungs and the Volkswagens and the Teslas of the world are going to want our low carbon nickel sulfide for their batteries. So it's a pretty exciting commodity to be in right now. Thank you. With that said, ESG is really important to us. Um, simply put, ESG is about operating the right way. It actually comes naturally to us. And in Tasmania and in Avebury in particular, we have many advantages. Uh, to begin with, 100% certified renewable grid power already in Tasmania. And the state is on its way to 200% renewable. To compare that to the national target of net zero by 2050 that we've set uh, in Canberra uh, just the other day, uh, Tasmania is streets ahead. The site itself is compact, as you saw, fully permitted tailings facility, and I'm delighted to say that future disposal of tailings and waste rock will be underground. The discharge water, naturally slightly alkaline. Uh, we've put a lot of work into establishing wetlands to make sure that it's clean. And of course, we're focused on safety, being a good corporate citizen and being a responsible large local employer. We follow the ICMM's mining principles and we've adopted a formal reporting framework for ESG and in particular for carbon. So you can expect to see a formal ESG report early next year and, and then annually thereafter. If you could turn the slide, please. So I'd like to turn briefly now to the resource. Uh, you can see it here in long section, coloured for nickel uh, and showing the drilling to date. And a couple of things stand out. It's been mostly drilled from surface. There's been very little below 400 metres. And so you can see the deposit, which forms into these large sort of lobes uh, perhaps 600 metres long, up to 60 metres wide. Um, and you can see they, they tend to stop where the drilling stops. So in each case, they're open at depth um, below, the, below the depth uh, of the drilling today. So it's pretty exciting uh, from that perspective. Uh, you can also see the mine's quite compact. So that 400 metre uh, depth has got the 30 odd million tonnes of resource in it. So very high tonnes per vertical metre very large stopes, that makes for very efficient mining, means that the haul distances are short. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite an efficient mine. Um, East Avebury, you can see there on the right-hand side of the slide, you'd outcrops on surface. I think that could be an open pit in the future. And then of course, we've got many years ahead of us on just the known deposit before we start stepping out and around that. You can see on the slide, the mine is accessed in the center where the Avebury and the Viking ore bodies meet. Um, and there are two years of levels already accessed below the lowest stoping level in the mine at this point in time. So it's well set up to be kickstarted into operation. Thank you. The underground mine, well established, 8.5 kilometres of development is in place. Ventilation, pumping, electrical and escapeway infrastructure is all good. It's all in place. It's all installed. It's all up uh, to a good standard for operation. Three main loads, uh, all accessed from existing development, which is developed two years ahead of the stoping front. And the mine's shallow. It's only a 1.8 kilometre drive from the very bottom of the mine to the portal at this point in time. And yet in that depth, there is two years of production that's already been accessed. And that's pretty exciting because that means this mine is ideal for battery electric machines. We're already working with manufacturers and it's a very exciting move. We're aiming to fully decarbonise the mine in the longer run. Our forward plan includes buying our first fully electric underground machine inside this financial year. So we're that close. And that's partly because the geometry of the mine lends itself even to the current technology that's available now. The ground is competent. The water, as I said, is alkaline and non-corrosive. And in short, the mine is immaculate. If you could turn over, please. If the mine's immaculate, the processing plant is pristine. It ran for nine months. They didn't even wear the paint off it and it closed during the global financial crisis. Uh, most of the plant's undercover. It's been well cared for during those years of care and maintenance. Um, we're four and a half months now into a six month refurbishment plant. Uh, by the time that's done, we'll have commissioning stocks of about 50,000 tonnes sitting on the ROM pad ready to go. So nameplate capacity for Avebury, uh, 900,000 tonnes per annum, uh, recovering 79% of the nickel, 20% concentrate. 
And the plant was designed to be expanded up to 1.8 million tonnes per annum. But I can tell you my work uh, during uh, my time here in the past showed that probably 1.2 million is, is optimum. And so we've included capital to achieve that in our $70 million target raise. Uh, reagent storage and mixing and the delivery system, one of the best I've ever seen. Tailings dam is fully permitted. Uh, this place is ready to run. Thank you. I'll turn briefly to exploration. We have two packages of tenements that we're working on. So uh, out to the west, so the left-hand one there around Avebury, um, the Avebury Arc, it refers to the edge of the ultramafic host that curves from Avebury towards Trial Harbour on the coast, just where the Heemskirk granite then dives underneath. And we think there's potential for many Averys in that district. And of course, we only found one so far. Um, so that's a pretty exciting area for exploration to find more Averys. And then something a little different at Melba, which is about 20 kilometres away um, up the road, we're really excited to follow up the high grade historical production that was there, nickel, copper, platinum group metals. Uh, we've acquired another tenement uh, because the, uh, the little ring of historical mines that was there um, prior to the 1960s kind of tracks the edge of the anomaly. Of course, the old timers didn't know anything about anomalies and so they were just where they found the, uh, the metal. We've acquired the rest of that, so that's very, very exciting. Uh, we're going to do a lot of exploration there in the uh, in the coming months and years. Thank you. I want to just turn to the picture going forward. Uh, we have milestones planned immediately following the completion of the capital raise. So timing on the current raise, uh, we are open until the 19th of August, and thereafter we'll be working with the ASX to return to uh, to trading, and we're hoping that will happen somewhere around about the back end of the month. Uh, so in the meantime, we'll be producing uh, from the Stokes. The underground mine is running already. A Stoke production will be in production by the end of this month. I've got two brand new tele-remote loaders um, that have arrived in Tasmania. In fact, there was a picture of them in the local paper this morning. Uh, we'll have 50,000 tonnes of ore on the stockpile by mid-September, and then we will restart the plant. And meanwhile, of course, as I said, the capital raising is going on, the shares return to trade. Um, and immediately after that happens, you then have this series of highly positive production milestones lined up. So you hit first production, you have your first sales and your first revenue a lot long after that. Um, then we get to the half year report, which of course this time around we'll be talking about a full quarter of production with all of our physicals and our costs and our revenue. So that'll be demonstrating uh, that we are a true producer. We'll aim to hit that 900,000 tonne per annum mark early in the new year. Of course, we'll be declaring a reserve and then exploration outcomes as we go along that aren't shown on this slide, but, but they're on top as well. So there's an awful lot coming at us down the pipeline in uh, not a very uh, long space of time uh, at all. Thank you, if you'd like to, to turn over. So I've just got a couple of pages of pictures really from site now. Uh, people say to me, is it really happening, John? And I say, absolutely it is, but here's the proof if you want to see it. So some of our, uh, our people at work, uh, we have now over 100 people on site heading towards a, a target in the end of 200 employees uh, when we're at full noise. So you can see the jumbo on the left there, that's drilling the first cut at Avery in 13 years. Uh, that was a pretty exciting day. Uh, on the lower right, you can see our mine rescue team on their first day of training, and they are uh, really committed. And I'm, uh, I'm always pleased to, to see mine rescue teams. I'm a big supporter of mine rescue in uh, in mines. If you want to go over the page um, for the last one, uh, there's some of our fleet at work uh, at the moment. Uh, that uh, picture on the right was the first truck of ore leaving the Avery portal in 13 years. Uh, that was a very exciting day for people on site uh, too. Uh, I can tell you. Uh, and that's it. You can perhaps go over to the end slide and, uh, and uh, Tim, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, um, a very exciting story, John, um, and quite a few questions. Can we go back a step and you, can you tell us, um, A, why the mine closed and you talk about restarting. Can you give us some kind of historical background here? Yeah, look, it was all a little bit unfortunate, actually, um, uh, why, why it closed. It ran uh, very briefly in, in the global financial crisis. So, um, it was uh, it was it was opened by Oz Minerals, but Oz Minerals had its own problems and was unable to financially support the mine uh, during that critical startup phase. Uh, the price fell away during that period, 
um, and a number of shortcuts had been made, a number of a number of items, things like the site laboratory, which is pretty handy to know what's going through your processing plant. That had been deleted from the spec and it wasn't built. Um, so while they were operating in that difficult climate, uh, they, were, they were kind of running blind. And um, so a series of, of problems with the way the uh, really corporate failings in the way um, the company was set up. And um, I, you know, I know a number of people who worked here at that time. We have some of them working for us here with us now, and um, they are just loving the chance to get back and do it properly this time around. And, and can you give us a little bit, I think you've understated your background here. Um, I know a couple of brokers speak very fondly of you. Can you give us a, a more insight into your background and kind of what excites you about this project? <laughs> yeah, look, I've been I've been around a while, as I said. Um, I was um, general manager of Century uh, for a while, so Century Zinc in uh, in Queensland. Uh, had a wonderful time up there, a very large site. Um, you know, as, as perhaps as people will know, I was general manager of the Rosebury Mine, which is a, an eighty five year old uh, underground mine just up the road from here. Um, interesting comparison between Avery and, and Rosebury. So the, the tonnage each year will be around about the same. Rosebury is a very deep, very old mine. So you think of a workforce of 500 people and, ten, and a fleet of 10 trucks. Over at Avery, 200 people and four trucks does the same tonnage. It just gives you a comparison of, of how, what the benefit is of being you know, large tonnage close to surface. Um, so those two are my sort of favourite operating mines. Uh, I've spent many years... Um, uh, in and around uh, Tasmania, as I say, I'm coming up on 35 years um, uh, at the end of uh, the end of this year. Uh, ran a civil construction company at one point um, and a, uh, a heavy haulage company. So um, probably some good experience I can uh, I can put to use here. And and you spoke about Rosebury. Can you give us an idea of kind of valuations there and and any other kind of peer comparisons that are in the market? Yeah, so um, people people do say to me, well, how do you, um, you know, how do you, how do you value, um, you know? And, and we're talking around our, our seventy cent share price. Now we we price that um, to go. We have said um, that's a great number for our existing shareholders because it's more or less a wash for them. We have about three thousand small shareholders in the company. Um, our shares have been suspended for a little while now, having come out of the, uh, you know, the issues we had uh, in Myanmar and everybody would understand uh, what happened over there. Um, so we wanted to make sure their value was protected, but at the same time, you want plenty of upside in the price for an incoming shareholder and, and an existing shareholder too, for that matter. Um, so, you know, what I would do if I were looking to, to get some valuation, I'd be going out to the peer group and I'd, I'd say for nickel sulphide producers in Australia, the peer group's pretty small. Um, so you're looking at Panoramic, you're looking at Mincor. Um, you can do a calculation then of EV, um, market cap being a rough proxy for that, but EV per tonne of nickel in their resources. Um, if you do that calculation for us, you get $847 per tonne of nickel contained in the resource. Um, people can do the calculation for the peer group for themselves, but you'll find that there is plenty of value upside in that 70 cent share price. And, and that's entirely deliberate. You know, we need this thing to be successful. I want the dollars to, to invest into the mine. Uh, I want to expand this mine. I want to explore it. I want to turn it into a mine for the future that produces the battery grade nickel and produces it in a low carbon way, uh, which we can do uniquely from Tasmania. Uh, but I want the capital raise to be successful, um, hence the pricing. And, and John, a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Now, arsenic was historically a, a kind of raised as a concern on the project. Can you give us a bit more colour on that, given yeah. your ESG credentials? Absolutely. Look, arsenic was a bit of a furphy, to be honest. Um, it does exist in the ore body. Uh, geologically fairly low, 200, 300 parts per million. Um, challenge in the past when this mine ran, um, the work had not been done to determine where the arsenic was in the ore body. So you need to do what I call big company drilling and assaying, you need to build a geometallurgical model of the ore body um, so that you can actually use that as a planning tool. Now, that work was done post-closure. So I actually arrived, I was general manager here um, while I was at Rosebury. Uh, I oversaw that drilling work, built up that body of knowledge. We have a beautiful geometallurgical model of the ore body now. So a block model, if you like, for arsenic, we know where it is and we know where it isn't. Um, we can plan around that. Uh, and we have a full detailed budget mine design, stoke design, scheduled out, put through the, the, the processing model. Uh, and I can tell you that arsenic is a, is a non-issue uh, in, our, in our output product. The other thing that was a problem in the past was 
the nature of the off-take agreement to sell the product demanded a very, very high grade and it could only go into China. And, of course, they ran into trouble with more arsenic than they expected because they didn't know where it was, concentrated up to very high levels because of the off-take specification, and then they couldn't sell it at times to their only customer uh, because of China's stringent import limit. We have a completely different arrangement. Our off-taker is Hartree. They're a trader. They'll sell the product anywhere, very flexible on grade, high payability, all the way down to 10% nickel and concentrate. And I can tell you after decades of mine managing, uh, your best friend is flexibility. And if you've got flexibility, room on commercial terms and product specs and uh, all of those things, then um, you can deal with you know, issues like impurities in your, in your ore uh, just disappear. So it's, a, it's really a non-issue um, these days. To be honest, if it was ever an issue, I think it was uh, the scapegoat for what I believe was a corporate failing. Understood. Now, let's let's finish on the offer. Um, you're looking to raise somewhere between 20 and 70 million. I mean, that's a big range there. What what does that allow you to do or, and not to do if, if you're not successful at the top of the range? No, it, it is a big range. Um, and, you know, fixed price, um, and, and, and therefore we went for some flex on, on the range. Uh, at the low end, that is enough money to get the mine going. So it pays for those things that I mentioned, like the laboratory, for example, that were deleted in the past and need to be built now, um, gets the mine up and running and, and, and operating. Uh, at the big end of the range, though, I've got money in there for a high-impact exploration program. That's really exciting. So that's underground exploration to expand the ore body, exploration on the Avery Arc to find more Averys, and exploration over at Melbourne to find some high grade. Um, so that's really exciting. The large end of the raise has also got capital in there to expand to expand the mine. So I, I want to go up to that 1.2 million that um, I understand to be optimum. Um, so there's money in there for extra mobile equipment. There's money in there for plant expansions where you need an extra filter press to produce the concentrate and, and some other things in the processing plant. So that is that's that is uh, the funding we need to take Avery to where it should be optimized, productive. Uh, we've turned our mind, therefore, to moving to the electric equipment uh, and it's a mind for the future. John, thanks for your time. I know I'm going to get lots of inquiries about this in terms of how investors can get access. So uh, I'll give you a buzz during the week if you don't mind. Yep, people don't want to miss out. Now's the time to get into nickel and now's the time to get into this one. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, John. Okay, everyone, that's all we have time for. Another great um, Hidden Gems webinar. Thanks all for your time. See you next week.